see, we have to understand how powerful what we think is. What we think about a situation, I would say for the believer, is even more powerful than the situation. How is that possible? Well, because you can have a minor situation that you could be over like this, but because you are perceiving it as major, it has shifted your entire life out of its place. So your thought was more important or more um, effectual than the situation itself. Or the situation can be huge. But because in your mind it's small, faith was activated and the huge situation was taken care of. Amen. So it's what's going on up here. So we really have, so, so the song is so powerful that says he's the savior of my soul. Yeah. See, we got it wrong when we went around saying the Lord and save my soul. He saved my soul, y'all. No, baby. He's saving your soul. But, but that's a process and he's not done just yet. He saved your spirit, but he is saving your thinking. He is saving your perceptions, your thought patterns, your mind, your emotions. He's, he's, he's in a process, watch this, of transforming you by the renewing of your mind. If, I, if, if my soul, if my mind got saved at the altar, I would need it renewed. But we need to have a change of mind. <clears throat> so the, the, the problem with this matter of perception is that from the moment that we were born, we have been trained to exist in this world according to this world. So as a child begins to understand that what he, see, he or she sees are actually physical objects that it can come into contact with, then it begins to touch the face of mama or begins to touch the furniture and begin to pull up on the furniture to stand up. It begins to realize through touch that it can interact with the world. All of the senses are means of interacting with the world, right? And we learn that from the moment that we're born. Then we get born again and we realize, well, I'll be, there's a whole nother world out there. Oh, yeah. Right? We have the physical, but then we also have the spiritual. We talked enough about this to know that the spiritual is higher above the physical. It is a higher plane of existence. It is the super on top of the natural. Right? The problem, though, is that oh, we talk about the power of perception. Even once we get born again and, and, and really tap into this other world, how we relate to that other world is still not the way God would have us relate to it. So we found out it exists, but then we don't actually operate in it the proper way. So here is how we live. We live for what I'll call from earth to heaven. I exist here. I relate here. I deal here, and then when I get something here that I need a little help with, I go there to get my help to fix what's here. God, that bill needs to be paid. I don't want to lose my car. I don't want to lose my house. It needs to be paid, Jesus. That was a here thing. I took the here thing there to get some help with the here thing. Right? Now, God is merciful and kind. He's loving. He's a provider. And he helped us with the here thing. That's still not how God intended for you to operate between heaven and earth. So the problem is that we have been operating from earth to heaven. Where you operate from, that's what you call your base. Your base of operations. But the word base also means foundation. It's your grounding point. Yeah, yeah. It's the place where you are centered and it is your focal point. It's the place from which everything else flows. Yeah. If you are based and grounded and settled on this plane, you've already messed up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Because when you got born again, notice what it says, born again. Because the first birth that grounded you here is what caused all the mess you're dealing with now. That means when you were born again, you were born, what the scripture said, from above, of the spirit. Which means now your, his intention for you is to be grounded there. Yes. Mm-hmm. That, that what, what the scripture, we'll read in a moment, but what the scripture calls the heavenlies have become your base. And no longer are you living from earth to heaven but he's desirous of us to live from heaven to earth okay and that is the problem that we have is that we have been living from earth to heaven so here let me kind of give you an idea of what this looks like on a practical level living from earth to heaven now I used the example a moment ago of having a bill that you can't pay because obviously you have bills you have issues and situations then those are practical things that we can really wrap our mind around we know about sickness and disease we get the sickness and we ha- here, here let me let me give you a good way to, 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 to look at it living from earth to heaven is being reactive it is sitting here waiting on life to happen and then responding to life when it happens by running to God to get help for what just happened. Do you realize that a life that is lived from earth to heaven is a life of helplessness? Why? Because you have subjected, to, to be subject to something is to be under its yoke. It is to be in bondage to it. It is to be a slave to it. We have subjected ourselves to this plane. And when this plane gets too tough, we go a running to daddy. So he becomes the fireman that puts out the fires of our lives. Turn to Colossians chapter 2 and let's see what God thinks about that. Isn't it sad that our prayer lives are characterized primarily by prayers of petition? Prayers of petition, you can perceive as rescue me. (laughs) We're calling out for rescue rather than prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of thanks and worship, prayers of communion. God, I'm just drawing closer to you. I'm getting to know you. What parent wants to only hear from their child when the child needs something? I never hear from you unless you ask them for help. No, I want to know you. I want to know this man, this fool that you have turned into that I I know I didn't raise. (laughs) Colossians Colossians chapter 2. I believe I'll turn there with you. Colossians 2, if you're there, say there. Excellent. Verse 20. Reading from the New American Standard as always, Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. And it says this. If you have died with Christ. Now this is supposed to be, this is a rhetorical question or statement because he knows he's talking to Christians. And so the implication is you have died with him. Paul is saying, look, my point is you actually have died, but you're not living according to that. If you have died with Christ to the elementary foundational basic principles of this world why as if you were living in the world do you still submit yourself to decrees to the laws and the principles of this plane why are you still submitting yourself another translation I believe the King James said why are you subjecting yourself why are you becoming subject why are you enslaved to these laws I don't have to be enslaved to the law of profit and loss because I have a wellspring of prosperity that follows me everywhere I go money doesn't grow on trees it does in my house because I'm not subject to the law watch this now that an apple seed produces apple trees that thing produces money for me. Right. See, 
We have to learn that there is a higher plane of existence that we have access to that should actually be our base camp. And the laws are different there. The laws are higher there. Paul is writing to human beings still living in the world. But he told them, he asked them, but why are you still responding to life as though you're living in the world? Now, is that what Paul, uh, hello, I am actually in the world. This letter you wrote to Colossae are act is actually a city in the world. We're here in the world. So why are you asking a question? He says, as in the middle of the verse, as if you were living in the world. Well, we are. And he said, that's the problem. Just because your physical body still exists on this plane does not mean that your base camp, your base of operation should be this way. According to him, it is implied that you are supposed to be living somewhere else. I just came here to work. But I live, I exist, I dwell there. And that's the place from where my life flows, not from earth to heaven, but from heaven to earth. We have to let go of our subjection to the decrees, to the laws, to the rules that govern this world. See, we, we oftentimes translate and interpret and understand the passage that talks about, you know, being I'm, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. We thought that meant I, we couldn't go to the show. I'm not of the world. I don't go to the bar. I don't, I don't go to the club. I'm not of the world. That's not what he's talking about. That's the same stupid reason the Pharisees used when they criticized Jesus for hanging out with sinners. Well, he's just being of the world. It's not where you go, fool! <laughs> Somebody actually told me, the church I was, I was, I was raised in, I asked the question about, um, and I was sincerely asking. So, so Paul, uh, in fact, it wasn't a question. I just overheard them say it. In, in Psalm 1, it says that, you know, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Right? <laughs> Somebody said, what did he just say? What did he say? <laughs> Touch the neighbor say, what did he say? No. But there's a verse in there that says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I heard somebody say that that meant you can't go and sit in seats that the sinners sit in. So I can't go to the ballpark and watch a ball game. This is literally the example they used. I can't go to the ballpark and watch a ball game because scornful people sit in those seats. I said, well, hell, scornful people sit in these seats. <laughs> I just, what the heck? I'm just like, the way we think is so amazingly off. Jesus clearly was sitting in the seat of the scornful. The very the little Zacchaeus um, uh, 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 tax collector climbing up under, <laughs> in the tree trying to see Jesus. And he said, hey, come on down here. Take me to your house. No one liked Zacchaeus because he was a, he was a crooked man. And Jesus was going to go sit in the seat of the scornful. If that was the way they were interpreting it, right? But clearly that's not what he meant. So we have to understand that what he's talking about here is not being not of the world, meaning I'm not existing here. I'm not here. Uh, I can't go where they go. So that's the one of the problems with evangelism. We don't want to go where they are. All we want to do is put up a billboard or send out a flyer that says, come to our service. Not go ye therefore, but come one, come all. That'll fix all the, 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 all the evangelical church growth programs in the church around the world. Because we, we, we have this whole thing backwards. So it's not about not going anywhere. It's not about not being around unbelievers. It's not about not being of the world the way we traditionally understand it. What he's talking about is dwelling or having as our home, as our base, as the place where we exist, the heavenly realm. And let me give you an example of what it looks like to live from heaven to earth. So living from earth to heaven is, is, is observing and living and responding to life from earth's perspective. All right. Living from heaven to earth is observing, living and responding to life from heaven's perspective. 
So let me give you an example. Some of you all may have seen on my wall on Facebook this past week that I posted a video of an eagle. So it's like a live feed of an eagle. I guess they had a, a camera attached to the eagle. A live feed of an eagle flying through the air. And it was just amazing. It's so cute, you know. It wasn't as phenomenal as it could have been because I've flown in an airplane before, so I've already seen that vantage point. But if you had never been up in the it had never been up in the air, that would have been an absolutely amazing thing to see. How high above life the eagle flew. You flew in the airplane and you realized how small the big things are. You know how much bigger than the eagle Goliath was? <laughs> Forget David. Look at the eagle. You know how much bigger than the eagle Goliath was? But he was only bigger while the eagle was on the earth. When the eagle took flight, all of a sudden, that big giant became an ant. Why? Because the perspective of the eagle changed. No longer was he looking from the earth up. He was looking from the heavens down. And because the heavenly realm now is super, is above, if we begin to look at our Goliath situations from that perspective, all of a sudden they don't seem that big. You can't freak out. Now maybe if, if you're my mother, you will. <laughs> but you can't freak out at the sight of one little ant. It's just an ant. And by the time I'm through with it, it's dead ant. Dead ant, dead ant, dead ant, dead ant, dead ant, dead ant, dead ant. Turn to Ephesians. You, you'll get it on the way home, it's all right. That's before some of y'all's time, huh? That's, that's all right. Ephesians 1. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about changing our perspective because... How we respond to an ant is different than how we respond to Goliath. Mm -hmm. But Goliath is an ant mm -hmm. from heaven's perspective. The bill is an ant. The sickness is an ant. Do you all realize how, listen, when somebody, we, we, I really want us to start being mindful of this. When somebody, when we use, when we're giving out the prayer request and the word cancer comes up. There's always, just like, I'm never, you know, it always happens. There's always a gasp. <gasps> no! Why? Because we're looking from earth. But when we look from heaven, it's, oh, that again? Because it's no longer a big thing to us. Because our perspective has changed. See, that's a very practical way of understanding how perspective shifts our reactions. When we, when, 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 when the word visceral means like it's your natural, reflexive, it's, it's, it's your base uh, uh, response to something. It's very, you didn't think about it first, it's just your reaction, your, your natural reaction. When our, when our visceral reaction to cancer or HIV or lupus or whatever condition or disease it is, Alzheimer's, dementia, when that becomes, oh, then we know that our shifting has started to happen. Because we no longer see that thing for what it is from Earth's perspective. But Pastor, they don't have a cure for that. I don't care. I want them to find one, but I'm not subject to the decrees of this plane. If we see it in Colossians, I'm not subject to that. I'm living by a higher law which says I shall live and not die. Right. Ephesians 1, verse 20. I want to bounce around a couple of places here to kind of show you this point that, Paul is, that we can make from what Paul is writing here. Ephesians 1, verse 20 says this. I, I kind of hate starting at the beginning of a sentence. I'll start in the middle of verse 19. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. He brought about this strength 
in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated Christ at the right hand in the heavenly places. God seated Christ in the heavenly places. Okay, Jesus was raised from the dead. And when he went to heaven, God seated him at his right hand in those heavenly places. Now skip over to chapter 2 and take a look, if you will, at verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus is seated in heavenly places. And he also raised us up with him. Who? Jesus. Well, where is Jesus seated? Where? In heavenly places. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are not in heavenly places in your humanity. You are in heavenly places in Christ. If you are in Christ, then you are in heavenly places. Now, have you ever had, a, well, maybe you haven't, praise the Lord. Have you, I was going to say, have you ever had a, a, a bag or something pulled over your eyes where you could not see and they took you somewhere and you were there, but you didn't know where you were? Now, you, if, you have, if it's never happened to you, you can imagine what it would be like. Maybe somebody wanted to surprise you, so they put a blindfold over your eyes. Don't be a fool, y'all. Your date ain't that cute. Don't let them blindfold you and take you somewhere. <laughs> right? But we get the idea that we, we can go somewhere and not be aware of where we are. If you are in Christ, if you are born again, literally right now, you are in heavenly places. Okay, we have to understand that. Now look at chapter one. Again, this time, verse three. Christ is in heavenly places. We are with Christ in heavenly places, seated with him. Now look at verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In the heavenly places. Where are our blessings? In the heavenly places. When do we get them? When we pray. When we believe. When we ask. No. When you were born again. Your blessing is now past tense. Everything you need, you now have access to. Because it has already been provided. Okay. Everything you need, you already have. You see, this is the problem of living from earth to heaven because we're asking God to give what he's already given. We're asking God to do what he's already done. Your healing already exists there. You exist there. So here's the thing. Every spiritual bless if God can bless you with it, he already has. Because every spiritual blessing. Now watch this. The exchange has already happened. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has. Not who is blessing or who shall bless, but who has blessed. Past tense. Us with every spiritual blessing. Those blessings, though, don't exist here. They exist there. Folk who exist here have a hard time accessing what exists there. And that is literally 95% of the church's, I'll call it lifestyle. We exist here. And when life happens, we run there and try to get help. All the time, let me rephrase that. Really, we don't even run there. We just pick up the phone and call. Call him up. Don't call him. Be where he is. See, while we're calling him and asking him to send it on down, he's saying, you're already up there. Get it. See, not only is it... See, if you're up there... Your blessing is up there, and your blessing has already been given to you. That means the responsibility then is no longer God's. 
It's yours. So when it doesn't happen, see, this is why church people get disillusioned and they get angry with God because they feel that God has failed them because they asked him, they fasted, they prayed, they believed. God, why didn't it work? He said, baby, I answered that before you even asked. But you were never taught how to tap into what you already have access to. Okay. There's nothing worse than dying of a disease that you had the cure to in your medicine cabinet. It, I don't mean like a, a quick fix. I don't mean like a, you know, a, a, a Tylenol to cover the symptoms for a little. I'm, I'm talking about the actual cure. It's right there in your house. And you are in your house. And you never took the cure that you already had access to. But that's how Christians live. We literally are not aware of what we have access to. So many of y'all may have heard about how a person has sold a house. Maybe the house was in their family for generations. They sold the house and the new owner was renovating the house, knocking down walls, and they found money in the house. Or they went up into the attic where you were too afraid to go. And they found that Rembrandt that was worth $100,000 or they found money up in the attic. Right. It was already there and because the house was in your name, it was in your possession and you didn't even know you had it. But having it is not enough. You got to know you have it. It's like losing your house to foreclosure when all the money is in the bank. You have a million dollars in your bank account. You have a debit card. <laughs> and all you need to do is go get it. But you don't because you don't realize you got it. That's pathetic. But that is literally the Christian existence. We have, see, one of the things that, 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 that I'm going to say bothers, but that vexes me is that we can hear stuff like this and then on a philosophical, theoretical level, we accept it. But we still are not actually living it. It hasn't really reached the bowels of our spirit to really tap and really have settled in us that everything we need, we have now. It's, but it's there. It's not here. So while you're up in the kitchen looking under the sink for the cure, dying, trying to find it, it's right there in the medicine cap. Now watch this. It's where it's supposed to be. The medicine cabinet. But you haven't went to get it. And that's what's been happening to the church. All right. We right now have everything we need, but it exists not on this plane, but in the heavenlies. Now, here's what we learn. We already have provision. A deficit in our lives is not a matter of provision. Okay? A deficit in our lives, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, a deficit in our lives is not a matter of provision because we already have it. Okay? It's not just available. It is actually in your possession. Now, if provision isn't the problem, then what is? Clearly, the question is twofold. Number one, where is it? Now we know it's there. The second question is, how do I get it? The question itself is flawed. You already have it. <laughs> See, when you're asking the wrong questions, you can't get the right answer. I just spent 30 minutes telling you you had it. And you still ask, how do I get it? I, passed, I didn't ask that. You asked that rhetorically up there. But I heard your spirit. <laughs> how do I get it, Pastor? I heard what you're saying. That's exciting stuff. But how do I get it? It's the wrong question. You already have it. Here's the question. How do I shift it? 
from there to here? See, now that's the right question. All right, now, here's the problem. We have to learn how to exist there where our stuff is. The reason that it's difficult to do that is because you can't call a home base a place you never go. If you, if you spend m most of your waking moments on this plane, then that answers the question of why you haven't learned how to access what you already have. We have a wonderful, rich time of worship and praise when the saints come together. But if you have not learned, I had such a good time in the presence of the Lord. I'm glad. But how much time did you spend in his presence at home? We take nothing away from the power of the corporate thing, but we're not, or we're not having church all day long. I would try and you wouldn't be here. I can't get y'all to come on Sunday morning. <laughs> so we have to make existing. See, David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. David said, I, even when I'm not there, I want to be there. Okay, let me put it this way. <clears throat> the physical church is but a shadow or a copy of the, of the presence of God. It's like the tabernacle of old, only being a shadow or a copy of the temple that was actually in heaven, right? It was just a shadow. Now, we can't expect the power of the Spirit to exist in its full expression in a copy or shadow. So we have to live or exist in the presence of God even outside of church where the television has been shut off. You know, but that's what I was saying. This particular talking about how to get in the spirit and how to, how to dwell there. I've been telling you this for I don't know how long, in, but we were talking about different subjects because there are so many different benefits that come with being in the presence of God. I was talking about how do you begin to see in the spirit? Right? Talking about you have to use your imagination. You have to activate the eyes of your imagination. You have to begin to imagine and to, and to think, to contemplate in your mind. You have to tap into worship and into the reflection on the scriptures and to uh, uh, fasting and to prayer and to meditation, which is, of course, again, the, the thinking, the revolving around. You, we've heard this stuff, but we still have allowed life to distract us from living there. I would like to think that getting it now from a different angle will help us to realize the power of it. But the truth is, until we have gotten enough of living here, there isn't a sermon in the world that's going to fix it for you. We have to get fed up with the limited existence. We have to get fed up with subjecting ourselves to these rules and these laws and these decrees when we are supposed to be better than that. It's like you are a king living as a pauper in a foreign land because you won't go back to your own land and be a king as you were born to be. Why? Because we've been there so long that that is what is comfortable. That is what is natural. That is what we know. And at some point, there has to be a breaking in our minds and in our thinking that we just can't. I know we say, I can't take this anymore. You don't have to. But the answer is not having an emotional breakdown. It's breaking up. Luke. In fact, you don't have to turn there. I'll just tell you what it says. Um, Luke 17, 21 says that the kingdom of God is within us. One of the problems that we have is that we're always trying to call the kingdom down. Right? 
God, send it down. Bring it down. Bring what I need down. I'm asking you to bring down the healing, bring down the deliverance, bring your Holy Spirit, Lord, let your Holy Ghost come on down. We're always asking him to do it. Send it. Bring it down. Because we haven't realized. Now watch this. We say that it's the heavenlies where it exists. And in our mind, the heavenlies is always upward. But Luke 17, verse 21 says, the kingdom of God is within us. So rather than, watch this, <laughs> this is lovely. Rather than all your provision being up and away, all of your provision, all of those blessings in heavenly places, the heavenly places are inside of you. So rather than God causing them to come down, the prayer is, God help me to release what's inside of me to come forth. Your blessings don't come down, they come forth. <laughs> when the praises go up, blessings come down. No, when the praises go up, blessings come forth. Because they exist in the heavenly realms inside of you, of your spirit. All right, now, I want to give you, f uh, how many is it? Four, I believe it is. Very, 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 very quick and easy steps. This may take three minutes, and I'm done. Four steps. That's all it is, saints. It's not some big rigmarole. I'm going to give you four practical steps of tapping in and causing what's inside of you to come forth. This stuff does not have to be hard. The scripture calls it the simplicity of Christ. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It does not have to be difficult. We made it difficult because we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Here it is. Step number one. How do you tap in and get what's within to come forth? Number one. See, or also I love to use the word imagine. How do you see? How do you see? Imagine. That's what the word means. See or imagine it as yours in the heavenly places inside of you. See or imagine it as yours, not way, way, way up in the sky, but in the heavenly places inside of you. All right. We, I cannot overemphasize this because this is the very place that we are missing it so often. See it as yours. Imagine it. Dwell on it. Meditate on it being yours in the heavenly places inside of you. Do you remember that sermon? I, I referenced it a couple of times recently. Seeing is, is receiving. You have to start by seeing it. Step number two, once you see it, believe that you have it. Believe that it is literally and actually yours. Hey, well, Pastor, shouldn't I believe it first and then receive it? Some, some things you can't really believe for until you see it. But I can't see it. They say that, you know, we shouldn't walk by sight. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about spiritual sight. You see it in the eyes of your imagination or the eyes of your heart. What Paul talked about in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. That God will open up the spiritual eyes to see. Those eyes are open through our imagination. So see it and then believe it. No, because you see it, that it's yours. Once you believe it's yours, confess it. See or imagine it, believe it's yours, and then confess it. Now, here's the confession. Here's the power of the confession. To confess it means to open your mouth and to issue the decree. Notice that Paul used the word uh, in Colossians, why are you living according to the decrees of this world? Remember, that's, what he said, that's the word that, the word that he used in the, in the uh, New American Standard. If you have, been, if you have uh, 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 been raised with Christ, why do you still subject yourself to the elementary and foundational principles of the decrees of this world? Okay? We don't have to live by these decrees, but we do live by those decrees. But understand... Up there, you are not, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house. No, I'm sorry. That's cute. That was nice from David because David wasn't born again. 
you are not a doorkeeper, you are not the janitor, you are not the cup bearer, you are not the armor bearer. You are a prince. See, well, it, what is a prince? You are a son. Okay? And with sonship comes authority and power. See, you are not up there serving, quote unquote, you are up there seated. Now the only ones who are seated are people of honor and people of power because they're seated. You don't sit in the presence of the king unless you're a son. And we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That means we are seated as sons and that means with that comes judicial authority. That means I can open my mouth and decree I can issue a legally binding decree in the heavenlies through the authority of my sonship. Y'all see that? But see, so here's the problem. I've been speaking it all day, Lord. I've been speaking it, speaking it, speaking it, speaking it, but it's still not happening. Where have you been speaking it? <laughs> You've been speaking it here, freaking out. But not there, sitting down. <laughs> In your mind, listen. So that means if you have to sit down and imagine yourself. In the throne room of high. Remember, Jesus said, baby, don't you commit adultery up here because you committed it up here. It happened. What's up here is real. We told our children it wasn't. It's real. In the spiritual realm. Imagine yourself seated in a place of honor. Imagine the angel, not the one that you're, 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 you're trying to be like. Ooh, I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to die. Lord, they got their wings. I don't need wings. Angels need wings. I can be right where I need to be in an instant because I'm a son. I get translated from one place to another. I don't need, who needs wings? See, we're trying to be lower. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest, visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than what? Nobody knows that verse. Angels, that's what it says. Thou hast made him. But pastor, you just said the angels are lower than us. That's right. I did. You know why I did? Because your translation is wrong. The word angels in the King James, in that verse, Psalm 8... Is Elohim. <laughs> we were not made lower than angels. We were made a little lower than God. And some of the newer translations actually do say, you have made us a little lower than God. Because that's what the actual word is in the Hebrew. Elohim. But we're so connected to the King James Version that we think that angels are of a higher order than humans. If you are born again, angels are sent to minister. The scripture says they're, they're to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. How can they, to minister means to serve. How can they serve us if they're higher than us? So angels hearken, they wait for the command. The scripture says they hearken unto the voice of his word. They're waiting for a decree to go forth. But we're not issuing the decrees, y'all. We're speaking things on their front. First of all, the, 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 the lowly saints, those of us who are just religious and haven't gotten a revelation, we're not speaking at all. Then we come up a little bit, we graduate a little bit, we hear a little word, and we find out we have authority to speak, but we only speak it here. Now, it, now it's t I'm glad you got that, but now it's time to graduate again and learn that we have to speak it there. And there, what we speak gets issued forth as a legal decree, and the angels immediately begin to respond and to go and to do what has been decreed. Because they hearken to the voice of his word, and your mouth gives his word voice. But pastor, what if I'm decreeing something that's not his word? Then it won't happen. So make sure what you're speaking is not from a place of vanity, but that you're putting voice to God's word. Now my healing, see that's his word, I know that. 
My provision, that's his word. My peace, that's his word. I can issue legal decrees regarding all of these things there. All right, now, you see it, you imagine it, then you believe it, then you confess it. Let's look, uh, I want to dig a little more into these legal decrees. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. For the sake of time, I'll just go ahead and read it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. It says this, But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore also we speak. So speaking comes after believing. Okay? Speaking comes and we believe, therefore we speak. So once you see it, believe it. Once you believe it, speak it. Speak what? Speak what you're believing. Let's look again. Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 17. Romans 4, verse 17 says this. As it is written, a father of many nations, I have made you. That's what God said to, to Abraham. In the sight of him, in the sight of God, whom Abraham believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, even God, who calls into being that which does not exist. Who calls into being that which, the, 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 another translation says, he calleth those things that be not as though they were. So he calls into being that which does not exist, right? What does that mean? Now to call, I like the word call because it, it gives us that idea of legalese. He's calling it. Now, you, this is amazing. You can't call it unless you've seen it. So, turn, well you don't have to turn there, you know it. Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse 3. He says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, right? And now here's the question. Before God said it, was there light? There, no, there wasn't in the physical realm, but there had to be in his mind. Otherwise, what does the word actually mean? Unless light already existed here, why would he even say, let there be light? There's no such thing as light. <laughs> light doesn't exist yet so to say let there be light what are you talking about God but it already did exist here why did it exist here because he already saw it he saw it here he believed it he knew it and then he spoke it and the speaking of it was a decree a calling forth he spoke it, hey, watch this, he spoke it from his mind into reality. The legal decree of what was already here. See, it's the same exact process that I'm giving you now that God used to create the world. Okay? See it, or imagine it, believe it, confess it. The legal uh, decree. It's the language of authority calling for decree. Now, the fourth and final is there are two words I want to give you for this fourth one. The first word is this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Watch this. And God saw the light. That it was good. That's verse 4. So Genesis 1, 3, and 4. And God saw the light that it was good. Okay? That means after he said it, he saw it. But past, if we back up, you told us he already saw it. Yeah. He only saw it because he saw it. There are two C's. You see, you believe, you confess, and then you see. You see in the eyes of your imagination, in your spirit, you see it. You believe it because you saw it. Then you issue forth the legal decree from the heavenlies. And then you see it. But now here's that thing about seeing it. Another word I want to give you for that is receive. Receive. Now we talked about the fact 
that, re- that, that sometimes getting is, a, is, is not a matter of God giving. He's already given. We just haven't received. I, mean, I, I use the example. I'll just bring it up again um, uh, in James where he talks about the double-minded man being unstable in all his ways. Well, in the, in the previous verse, he talks about uh, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men freely, who gives to everybody freely. But then he kind of, kind of contradicts himself. I talked about it before. He contradicts himself by saying, well, but, you know, let not the double-minded man, let not that man believe that he shall receive anything from God. Say, so, wait a minute. You just told me God gave to all people. That includes the double-minded man. So how does he give to all people, but the double-minded man can't receive? Because God gave it, he just didn't receive it. Okay? So then that requires us now, in this process, if we're going to confess it, if we're going to see it, if we're going to believe it, if we're going to confess it, we have to receive it. How do you receive it? I demonstrated in previous messages. You don't... Let me demonstrate it again. Hey, Sister Marcia. Now, this is just for demonstration purposes. <laughs> ask me, one, two, three, ask me for five dollars. Say it again. Thank you. The first thing she did, she didn't say, ooh, now I can buy that refrigerator I'm always wanting. No, so the first thing she did was five dollars. The first thing she did was say thank you. That's how you receive. You receive by giving thanks. If you haven't given thanks yet, then either you are a very selfish and ungrateful Christian or you haven't received it yet. Because the first thing a, per- a responsible Christian does is say thanks. Because if mama taught you anything, it's when somebody gives you something, say thanks. Now give me my money back. <laughs> I got bills to pay y'all now. <laughs> All right. So you receive it by giving thanks. Now. I've said it, I've said it again, and I'm going to say it again, because I want to make sure when you leave this place, you you, you got how this thing works. How do you actually live from heaven to earth? You get in his presence, you stay in his presence, until his presence becomes second nature to you. I need you to begin practicing the presence of God. Practice the presence of God. I want you to eventually get to the place where he gets at least an hour of your time a day. But if you have to start off with 15 minutes, then start off with 15 minutes. Do it for a week. Add another 15 minutes. Do it for a week. In a month's time, you should be up to an hour. Give him an hour of your day. How do I do that? Meditating, contemplating, prayer, worship, getting still. S-T-I-L-L, getting still in his presence, being quiet, listening, using your imagination to see. See what? I don't know. It's your imagination. See. See the healing. See the deliverance. See yourself worshiping at his feet. See those 24 elders casting their crown. You want a good, a good way to see in the spirit? I want to spend time in the throne room of God. Okay, great. Go to Revelation. Read John's description of what that throne room looked like. The four living creatures with the four faces. The 24 elders casting their crowns. You read it and then close your eyes and use your imagination to visualize it. Visualize it for an hour. What are the angels that are there doing? Well, I see some, this particular kind of angel is flying, but he has six wings. He's two, two of them are flying. Two of them are covering his eyes from the brightness of God's glory. Two of them are covering his feet. We have a description of that. I believe it's over in, um, I, I believe it's over in Isaiah. We have a description of, of, of that. I see other angels who are literally on fire. I can see them, but there are flames throughout them. They're the burning ones. So we have these examples of what the, what the prophets have shown us what this stuff looks like. So use your imagination to see it. And then God will begin to trans, translating you, transporting you.
to these, to these places that you have begun to create. Not create, but tap into in your mind. Now, once God actually begins shifting you from here to there, things might look a little different than you were initially imagining it. But you have been demonstrating um, uh, uh, the pursuit of these things with your spirit. And then you'll, be, you'll begin to actually live and dwell in that place. Now, I'm telling you, and I'm pleading with you, and I'm begging you to do it. But I'm also telling myself, get off Facebook, get off the computer, get off the website you're trying to build, and spend this time in the presence of God. Because this is the court of God. And in a court, legal decrees go forth. And we have a right, I'm going to do a whole a uh, uh, lesson on these legal decrees and the courtroom of God that we have a right to issue these decrees but they have to be issued from the heavenlies and this is how you get there we spend the time in the presence of God we spend that time in the presence of God we begin to see and imagine imagine yourself hugging him imagine yourself embracing him imagine yourself like the woman crying and wiping his feet with your tears my hair is not long enough but I brought a towel wiping his feet and imagine then uh, these decrees. Imagine yourself, whatever it is that you need from God, it's financial, emotional, relational, whatever it is, imagine that you're there, seated in His presence, and everything you have is right there. I don't mean on one other side of the room. He, the, the exchange took place, it's yours. Imagine it sitting there in your hand. You're literally sitting on a throne next to God, and everything is in your hand. Pastor, that new house can't be in my hand. Yes, it can. When you're this high, it's as small as an ant. It's in your hand. The healing in your hand. Imagine it. See it. See it. Then believe it. Then decree it. And then receive it. That's it. It is that simple. I'm so hungry, y'all, to hear the testimonies of what's going to come from this. But they are not going to come if you don't activate this. So I challenge you, please. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But there is nothing more important than this. The, the, this is a key to the kingdom. Man, if we'll get this right, nothing will be looked at the same way.